All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us today. My name is Haley Bicey, and I'm the Client Success Manager at Reflection Sciences. Um, and I'm going to let my two lovely co-presenters introduce themselves briefly as well. I am Anne Brockenhoff. I work for the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education, and I serve as the Conscious Discipline State Implementation Lead for eight-year-olds and also on a connect team, which helps um, children and classrooms with challenging behaviors. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Joy Winchester and I am the director of the Office of Early Childhood Development. And I direct the challenging behavior team and also uh, all teams birth to five, which includes our early Head Start partnership. So looking forward to today. Thank you both for joining me here today. Um, I'll just give a quick background on myself and Reflection Sciences. So Reflection Sciences um, is the accumulation of 20 years of groundbreaking research from Dr. Stephanie Carlson and Dr. Phil Zalazzo. Um, they gave, got an assess, um, basically created an assessment through an NIH grant um, to test executive function skills. And since then, they brought that to the research and educator market, hence why we are here today and our work with Alabama, I've worked at Reflection Sciences for about a year and a half now. Um, I graduated from the University of Minnesota from the college where um, kind of overall college where Stephanie and Phil were doing their research from. Um, I graduated in May of 2020, which was very fun. As I'm sure you can all imagine, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I just kind of really liked what both my parents did and my dad was in technology sales. And my mom was in education and now I'm in education technology sales. So kind of combining both the passions um, that I grew up around and selling a product uh, from my college that I uh, graduated from as well. So that's really cool. So a little bit about today's plan here is I'm gonna walk you through the what and why of executive function, um, what resources we use to support executive function. Um, and then Joy and Amy are gonna go a little bit more into the Alabama department of early childhood education and what they're doing with us and their unique perspective. And then we'll have a little bit of time for some questions and answers. So with a quick review of executive function, executive function is often called the air traffic control center of the mind. It is set a set of foundational decision-making and cognitive relationship skills that we use to control ourselves. So there's three skills, um, working memory, the ability to keep information in mind, to manipulate it and use it in some way and to update it when needed. Inhibitory control, the ability to master uh, distracting thoughts and impulsive behaviors in order to focus, prioritize and complete tasks. And then finally, we have cognitive flexibility, which is the ability to switch gears between activities or to think about a problem in multiple angles. So these are all really skills made um, for organizing and controlling our thoughts, actions, and emotions. So we are gonna do a little activity. Um, so I'm gonna have everyone read the word out loud. Um, you can kind of do it quietly where you're sitting, um, but just read the color of, or read the color of the word out loud. And go. Red, green, blue, yellow, pink, orange, Okay, and so now for the second activity, I want you to say the color of the word. And go. So there was some confusion or a little bit more difficulty with the second um, activity, which this is pretty typical for when um, your executive function skills start to break down. Um, the first activity was super, very easy. We're doing something we can basically do on autopilot, reading. Um, and it helped that the colors and the words were congruent with the word itself. But when you have to inhibit the skill of reading, hold a new role in mind to say the color and think flexibility, 
flexibly as you move from word to word, all the main components of executive function are being tasked in these simple in this simple activity. So this is tricky for us as adults, but it's especially hard for children. Why are all these skills important? Um, well, executive function is important for a lot of different ways. Um, we use these skills in every day through habit um, and through our social contexts. We need um, to focus on conversations to act appropriately. Executive function is involved in our changes in behavior, um, like a New Year's resolution. Anything that involves breaking habits requires us to work at changing our ways and focusing on our goals. And any kind of problem solving situations at work or in our personal lives, when we need to think outside the box or consider lots of options. Executive function with a combination of cognitive flexibility, working memory, and inhibitory control is really a foundation of learning and adaption that applies across many different kinds of situations. An executive function uh, predicts success. Unlike IQ, executive function skills can improve throughout life. Research shows that executive function predicts achievement and plays a strong role in a child's success in their early years and throughout their life. With intervention and practice, executive function skills can improve. And really what I wanna highlight here is that you can see that main years that executive function is really growing is in this early childhood. So us at Head Start, um, we know that we are uh, reaching kids when their EF is really growing. Uh, so we know how important it is to change it and to do that early intervention. And so reflection sciences, we kind of have, uh, we see a three-step process or the three ways around executive function um, that we allowed. So we say, understand what executive function is, measure your executive function, and then improve. Um, so for understand, uh, we have a professional development library. These are online asynchronous courses that take about two to three hours to complete uh, online self based We have learners and facilitators guides to assist uh, with a professional learning community. So we break down our courses uh, into kind of the first 200 level, which is our core curriculum. Um, so that's understanding executive function, really going into more of the depths of it, and then understanding intervention strategies to optimize growth. And then the third course is really understanding your data. And then we kind of go into some more specialty courses like the role of trauma and how it affects development. Um, how does executive function and SEL connect? How to manage your classroom through an EF lens? And then as a teacher, how do I reflect on my own executive function and grow it? Um, and then we say to go to the next step, which is measure. So uh, our assessment was based off of uh, the award-winning assessment, uh, MEPS. But our EF Go Pro assessment was built to be delivered in the classroom. So it takes on average about five minutes per student, and you get uh, a score right away of where the student's executive function skills range compared to their peers of about 60,000 US students. Once you get the piece, now this is what us as educators really care about is how do I improve them? So we provide you then personalized uh, intervention activities. Uh, this is through us and um, we have activities and we also uh, partner with other curriculum companies such as Conscious Discipline, um, which is what the state of Alabama is using. But we all of these activities are uh, pretty familiar activities that uh, educators are used to, such as red light, green light. Every child uh, can do the normal rules of red light, green light, or red light is stop and green light is go. But where you switch up the rules where green light is now stop and red light is now go, it's an executive function rule change. And you'll find that some of your kids, depending on their age and their score level, might not be able to handle that rule change. So how as you an educator, can you improve their executive function skills through structured play? Um, and then we also have digital activities. Um, so each child has their own link uh, that can be sent out to parents or use on any type of device. Uh, that we recommend five activities based on uh, their uh, most previous EFCO Pro score. And then we track the digital activity usage as well to see how that then will impact their next assessment and their growth. All right, Amy, I'm handing it over to you. 
Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got hooked up with um, Haley and um, Jeff at Reflection Sciences. Um, so our department's journey, the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education, we started our journey with Reflection Scientists right here with these two ladies on the screen in one of our pre-K classrooms. These ladies had a little fella in their classroom who was struggling with many aspects of just joining a classroom and having some structure in his life. At the time, I was their coach and my friend and now my boss, Joy Winchester, who you're gonna meet in just a moment, um, suggested that we give these ladies a crash course in conscious discipline. Um, Joy suggested that these ladies spend about 10 to 20 minutes a night learning about and practicing strategies to help themselves and to help this little fella in their room be successful. So through this suggestion, a 40 night book study was born. And the dedication of these two teachers, Brittany and Leticia, the dedication of Joy and of myself changed not only our adult lives, but it started a grassroots effort to change our practices across the state of Alabama. Um, word spread throughout our programs throughout the state and over 200 classrooms joined this book study and a ripple of change began. We focused on identifying the needs that behaviors were communicating and implementing strategies to satisfy those needs. And as we put those strategies in place, we began to access our executive functioning skills more often and to help children build their executive functioning skills as well. You can flip it, Haley, if you want to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so word spread throughout our department and soon not only were our first class pre-K classrooms across the state implementing conscious discipline and accessing their executive functioning skills, but our early Head Start classrooms, our birth to five-year-old programs, our kindergarten to third grade classrooms wanted in on this knowledge as well. Our coaches across the department wanted to learn and grow right along with our teachers. And as we visit our classrooms, one of our practices is to reflect with teachers when we're in their classrooms. While we focus on their strengths within that classroom and also within that individual teacher. As our coaches reflected with our teachers, we began to notice that there were strengths and we also began to notice that there were some struggles through these reflective conversations. And that sparked some curiosity for us and we began to look at things just a little bit differently. You can go ahead and flip, Haley. Thank you. So we began to ask ourselves, how could we make this reflection process more beneficial to everyone, both for those that do find reflection easy, easily done and for those that find reflection a bit more difficult? We became curious in our thinking and our efforts to build executive functioning. We understood the importance of that executive function, those skills such as attention, time management, organization, impulse control, flexibility, as well as more. And we really wanted to support everyone we could and continue to support everyone we can with the ability to access these skills as well. Now, Joy, who is an extensive researcher, learned a lot about a tool called MEFS, which stands for that Minnesota Executive Functioning Scale. And the more she learned and the more she shared, the more excited we got and a partnership was born. So Reflection Sciences is supporting us with the EF GoPro tool 
which helps us to assess both children and adults in our programs. And as as they're supporting both of those groups with strategies, we're also building those executive functioning skills for our adults and for our students. Our goal is to improve our executive functioning skills so that we can truly help each individual be all that they can possibly be. It's exciting work, it's important work, and it's making a difference across our entire state of Alabama. So how do we get there? One of the first places to begin as adults is looking at how we view the world and the mindset that we have. So I'm gonna introduce you to my friend and my boss, Julie Winchester, and you're in for a treat as she's gonna walk you through those mindsets and also help us look at impacts that affect our executive, executive functioning skills. So, Joy, take it away. Joy. Joy must be frozen, I think. Oh. Um. And see, I was trying. Are we back? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I was trying my best to get on stable connection. I apologize. Oh, wi Fi is not our friend today. Well, anyways, so let's ask you this if you had a chance to be a polar bear in the zoo or a polar bear in the wild, which would you choose? And here's your options Do you want to be a polar bear that every day you know where your food is coming? but you're living in a pen and you don't get to explore. You don't get to use the resources that you were given to be a polar bear, right? Everything is set out for you. Everything is given. There is no need to see two things. Or would you rather be a bear in the wild? There's some challenges. Hunt for your food. And every time you fail, you're gonna learn. You're going to be in the wild and the resources that you were born with to become who you were meant to be. And life is not going to be easy, but it's going to be how you were designed to live it. Now, if you say, you know, Joy, I'll be honest with you. I want to be a polar bear in a zoo. Give me a pink hat. Give me a pink ball and feed me graham crackers every day. Right. I do not wish. What that says and what that is, we get, we get trapped, we become safe, we become locked in to what we've always done. And that's the most dangerous thing we can say in education. This is the way we've always done it. That's the most dangerous thing. I'm working on my doctorate now, and I'm always fascinated with how the neuroscience is changing. One thing that we know is your vision, your mindset tells us if you can change or not. And what we know is some adults have a fixed mindset. They want to be the polar bear in the zoo. They aren't as smart as they're going to be. They don't want to fail. They don't want to take risk. They just want to be. But the problem with that is you don't open up all your intellectual possibilities. Is, I'm going to try. I want to hunt every day. I want to go every day. I want to take risk every day because I want to use what to be the person, the being that I'm meant to be. But here's the trick. You got to believe you can change because change is hard. See, what we know is that the brain does not like change. The brain likes you to be very safe and lazy and happy. Because that's what, you're safe, right? The brain's like, why do you wanna, you wanna lose weight because it's New Year's Eve? Why do you wanna lose weight? You've survived 40 years being a chunky, happy woman. Why do you wanna lose weight now? That's not safe. So you start your diet, 
and it gets hard because change is hard and real change is real hard. But the mindset would every time I change, I'm changing the structure of my brain. I'm building pathways. Now, what does all this have to do with executive function? Glad you asked. It has to do with it because you're to the skills you need to be a wild polar bear. Here's what's really cool. A polar bear or you in the zoo range would never tap in to creative thinking or storytelling or prioritizing work or paying attention or having goals or showing empathy. That's not needed if your world is provided for you. So higher thinking skills, when we work with teachers, this is what we're working with. And what we found, like Amy said, is we started stumbling on, wait a minute, we had all these kids that we've got some low executive functioning skills. But I know from some research that if an adult experiences trauma before the age of 20, it could impact their reflective capabilities such that they have the capabilities of a 12 year old. Yet I'm going into classroom. I need you to think back on what you just did. How did that go? What are you gonna do better? Let's practice based coaching. I have been a practice based coach for quite a while. But what if? I'm not looking at my teacher for who she is. What if I have to look at her a little different? And that's what we're trying to build here in Alabama is I can't go into every teacher and assume they're a hundred percent and they're ready for to see me. And they're looking to see what I'm going to tell them to do better today. Look, there's some days that I have a coach. I don't want to see my coach. And when I have a team, I direct a team about and what we say to them is when you pull up in that center's parking lot, when you pull up in that head start, when you pull up in that family child care home, does the teacher open the blind? Oh, good. Amy's here. Yes. Or do they go, oh, Amy's here. Well, my cleaning supplies are up. Let me make sure my plug covers are on. Okay. That's what that's going to require. They don't this as a partner as part of their growth mindset, it won't change. Haley, will you change the slide, please? So let's say you say, let's say you say, let's say you're asking, well, what if I just don't have growth mindset? Well, you do, we all do. We're all born with it. Uh, we have prove every person on this call can change. Every person you change, it's called neuroplasticity. And it is well documented. In the 1980s, there was this, um, and some of y'all may be old like me, you might have remembered there was um, a belief that you were born with the exact number of brain cells you were going to have when you die. And there used to be ads on TV that said, alcohol kills brain cells, you'll become stupid. I, um, it's probably the ad because I was younger then. I just remember thinking, I can't drink because I'll be I'll lose all my brain cells. What we know now is that was wrong. And science changes. Science changes, which is what science is supposed to do. We get better technology, we get better questions. And what we know is that every day your brain grows. It's called and it grows to keep you alive. And it grows to help you develop functioning and adapt to your wild polar bear life. Isn't that cool? To me, it's great because some days I'm not real bright. And I just think to myself, hey, tomorrow, maybe I'll grow some better brain cells. <laughs> but other times I'm thinking we can grow these cells. We can, every time we move, believe it or not, you grow new cells. In fact, if you want to nerd out with me a little bit, let's nerd out a little. Do you know that you store memories in a place in your brain called the hippocampus? I'm being very simplistic, but here we go. Do you know that if you exercise 
is walk 30 minutes a day you will actually grow new cells in your hippocampus. And what they have found is that people over the age of 60, if they walk every day, just 30 minutes outside, blue skies, green trees, you can actually drop your risk of dementia. Because see in dementia, when they do an autopsy, the hippocampus is non-existent. So what's the moral of this story? Go home, take your parents on a walk. They need to get outside. Grow those brain cells. And the same is true for children. Same is true for you too. You can move. You can challenge yourself. And by the way, if it feels uncomfortable, you're probably doing it right. Because growth never happens when you're comfortable. Growth only happens when you're stepping outside of the box. If it's easy, you're not growing. A zoo polar bear. And we need to be uncomfortable to access these ELs. The reason I'm saying we executive functioning skills and measuring them, if we couldn't grow them, that would be a dead end. That would be, that'd be a waste of time and money. But with the science that we know that these skills can grow with the correct interventions, then why not? Here's something else you need to know about your EF skills. Right now, you're watching a webinar and you're probably pretty bored. Well, you might, actually, you'll probably listen to me about hmm, 10 minutes, maybe seven. And then you're going to click off thinking if you got to go make chicken for dinner and then you'll come back. And that's OK. That's your EF skills working. Right. No one can pay attention for an hour, especially on a webinar. So my feelings not hurt. But just keep coming back to me. I'll try to keep it lively. But here's the piece. When you are stressed and when you are calm, you are two different people. So calm right now, you're able to plan, you're able to prioritize attention. You're not cussing randomly. Hopefully, if you are, please mute. You're not um, getting angry. You have access to your skills. But when you get stressed, guess what happens? You lose access. You become a shadow of who you are meant to be. And we try to explain this to our teachers because in training, they're like, yes, Joy, we need to breathe with the children. We need to talk with the children. We need to hug the children. Yes. And then school day comes and Malachi comes in and he has wet himself on the way to home. And Caroline just threw up on the carpet. And oh, by the way, your co-teacher, she's out sick, but you know she's not because you saw her on Facebook and you know what she did. And then, you know, so-and-so is here. And suddenly you don't want to talk to anybody. You don't even like a job anymore. And that's okay, because guess what? You're human. But if I can call your attention to that and say, hey, look, when you're stressed, you're not going to be able to reach out into your backpack, this amazing tool. What can we do? And that's what we can do. That, guess what that's called? Metacognition, an EF skill. And if I can get you aware of, wow, I'm getting stressed, I'm starting to be the person I'm not meant to be, then I can coach you through some stressful times. I can coach you through when you're so frustrated with a child that you might do something you wish you didn't do. So the last thing I want to point out on this slide is about reflection. We use reflection, that reflection, like it is the easiest thing in the world. And I have probably coached more people than I want to admit. And the true ability to reflect is a higher order thinking skill that you have to be calm, safe, and connected to use. So when we go in and we expect our teachers to reflect with us, to fill out a form, to reflect through reflection, if we're not taking in the human aspect of that ratio, that problem, then we're not coaching. We're providing technical assistance. But that reflection is huge. If you don't know where they are with their EF skills, how do you know? where they are in their reflection abilities. And here's the really great thing though. Let's jump back because a lot of y'all are saying, well, what are we going to do if we have people who can't reflect? So glad you asked. What you have is neuroplasticity. 
And what that means is I can model for you reflection. I can scaffold reflection. I can create reflective experiences that are easy for you to get to. So then you start being more reflective on your own. And that's the coaching piece. All right, Haley, I think everybody's tired of this slide. Let's go. All right, so when I train schools, I do a lot of work with K-12. Um, Amy Brackenhoff and I are actually working in some programs right now where we have children who are very violent and they have pulled them out of classrooms where we are only using basically conscious discipline and building their EF skills to get them back into general population. And so far, knock on wood, no. We're year two, it's been very successful. In fact, they've expanded it to the high school level now. Um, so we are actually working with teenagers on developing their EF skills. And I have to say the product name right because I am not very smart on product names. EF Go Pro, right? See, long time ago, I referred to it as something else and I was told no. Anyway, sorry. EF Go Pro um, is actually what Amy and I are using to help those children as well. So let's talk. When I talk to schools, I actually say to them, walk one direction on one line and one direction on the other line. But the problem is, is as a visitor to the school, I'm sometimes not told which line to walk on. And I'll be honest, I sometimes don't even think about it. So I was in a school walking down the hall checking my emails, not doing what I should have been doing, which was paying attention. And a little girl walks into me, into me physically. And I looked down at her and I said, hey, sweetie, what's wrong? And she whispered, you're on the wrong line. So I stepped 12 inches to the left and she kept walking. Now, if you think that little girl did exactly what she should have done, she stayed on the line, Joy, she obeyed the rules, then this whole presentation is not for you because that's not 21st century skills. See, 21st century skills are, there is a woman walking towards me and she's a little large. Let me say, excuse me, ma'am, let me step off the line if I can't find my voice. Let me say, lady, you're on the wrong line. You see, she didn't. She is so programmed for compliance, which is 20th century education. EF skills is 21st century education. And we have to build it in Head Start. In this Head Start years, three to five is the most malleable time to build these skills. We know this in neuroscience. Five to seven is another window of opportunity. But three to five is it, y'all. So as we're walking down these lines, do we want children to follow the rules, but also know that, hey, you can step off the line if you need to. That's 21st century skills. I was listening to a webinar this morning um, on the way into work. And it was looking at the job market for when our kindergartners will graduate. Guess what? Do we know what jobs are gonna be out there when they graduate? Because the Department of Labor sure does not. Think about how much has changed in the last 10 years. Who went to school and their teacher said, Joy, you better learn your multiplication tables because you're not gonna have a calculator in your pocket. I got, I got a whole computer in my pocket, Heifer. I mean, I'm not being funny, but let's be real. We got a whole computer. What's going to change in 10 years? What do we prepare our kids for? I work in a department where I have to do school readiness all the time. Every EHS, CCP, Head Start, I'm doing school readiness goals. School readiness, Alabama has a whole school and career readiness. Every state does. But what are we preparing them for? Because we don't know what's out there. But I do know this. I do know I'm going to need employees who can think on their feet. I do know in a, in a world today where I can be on a team with someone who's not even speaks my language. I just finished courses at Harvard. And guess what? Amy and I had teammates from China. 
We had teammates from Singapore. We had teammates from Korea and we did not know their names, but we were expected to collaborate with people. We couldn't speak their language, but thanks to technology, we could communicate. That's not what 20th century education was gonna do. Look at how we ask our kids to be curious. Challenge the teacher, ask the questions. That's 21st century. And every bit of 21st century education is executive functioning skills. And if you can't measure it, how do you teach it? That's the biggest thing. As a teacher, I've been a teacher for 26 years now. Old dog, still learning new tricks though. Because why? Neuroplasticity. Pretty cool. All right, Haley, let's keep going. So why do we have to do this? So basically, children need models to learn from and they need to play to build these skills. See, when we, when we take play, we take something important. Every mammal, dogs, otters, monkeys, every mammal, polar bears, play. We play. We play to learn life skills. Children need to play. I had one teacher say, I dress them up and put them in dramatic play, but they don't do nothing because they don't know how to play. There's an example, there's some uh, research done. In 2007, they asked five-year-olds to stand still. How long can you stand still? And the five-year-olds were like, okay, I got it. Mm. And they stood still as long as three-year-olds in the 1920s. Now, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, is that a good or bad thing? Well, our society does not move as slow as it did in 1920s. Think about all the time-saving technology you have in your hands and how little time we have. I literally am always connected to anyone who wants to find me 24-7. However, we also have to ask ourselves why that little guy can't stand still as long. But... They then asked the little boy, can you stand still and pretend you're a soldier? And he did it three times as long. Play. Play opens up inhibitory control, cognitive flexibility, and self-regulation. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about these in these three big pots, and then they can be broken down into little skills. But these three big pots are important. Play teaches rules. Play teaches how to interact with each other. A lot of times teachers will facilitate that play and that's okay, but just wide open play. Uh, we, were, we had a call the other day and we were all talking about how different our childhoods were from our own kids' childhoods. Just think about that. The way my, I have a 26, 21 and 19 year old. My childhood was different from their childhood. And when I played at my school's playground, never forget, we had an asphalt parking lot. And the teacher would open the gate and be like, go play. And we made up games. We had rules, complex systems of rules that if a new kid joined the school, bless them, they needed a handbook. But all of us knew the rules and we had these games and we played outside and we learned how to interact with each other play. We see a lot of our kids don't have this. I have my EHS CCP program. We look at our kids and their fine motor skills are falling. Why? Because they can do this, but they can't do this. So how do we build that? How do we engage these skills in play? And that is what we want them to understand is you can build these skills just by engaging in play. Red light, green light, ready, set, go. That's all inhibitory control. Um, <laughs> this is probably not. Amy and I, when we train together, we try to teach teachers what this is like to cognitive flexibility, to shift on a dime. And so what we'll do is we'll have a lecture, and then they have an activity. 
to bring them back, one of us will raise our hand up and go, oh, and everyone in the room goes, shift. Now, the reason we do that is A, it's a movement to shift the brain, but it also is bringing attention that I am using an executive functioning skill to move your brain from one activity, small group discussion, to a large group. I just need you to pay attention in inhibitory control. You're going to have to be quiet and take in information. And that's a huge shift. We ask children to do it all the time. Ask me and Amy how many times we can't get people to come back from talking because it's hard, but that shift is important. So another thing to think about is as you're coaching your teachers, we've actually done some informal assessment of our teachers. And what we find is a lot of them have ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And they bring with them a lot of triggers. They bring with them a lot of baggage, don't we all? But if you're asking to coach them and they are triggered by behavior, they may not be able to access their EF skills. Yet we're asking them to reflect. We're asking them to change their practice and add in a new strategy. Throw in a little more science here. You ready? Let's say that um, a little boy, when he gets angry, he hits. When I get angry, I'm going to hit. It feels good. It's effective. And I've done it my whole life. It's been modeled to me. And I like it. And you're like, well, I'm sorry, little dude. You can't hit anymore. And he is like, what do you want me to do? And so we as teachers will say things like, just say no. We as teachers will say, tell me what's wrong. But now remember, his strategy is a physical strategy. Because why? When he's angry, cortisol floods the muscles, floods, 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 and he's got to get it out. And you know what the best way to get out cortisol is? Hit. So we say, use your words. Use your words. And then sometimes they use words and we're like, be quiet. Don't use those words. Not at school. Right? And then we talk to parents. And they're like, we don't know where they got those words from. And we're like, we don't either. Anyway, so what we can do is teach him a physical strategy. And what that can look like is when you get angry, say, stop, stop. And this will become a cuss word in your classrooms. And we know this, but kids love it. It's powerful. It's a movement. It's crossing the line. So step one, physical. Step two, stop. Step three, stop. And that's how I teach kids to use words. So here's this neuroscience behind it. Ready? You ready? How many times would that little guy have to use this stuff before he never goes back to hitting again? How many times would it take to build a neural pathway so that if he never goes back to hitting again, you know you've done your job? Anybody want to guess? 50, 2000. This is why EF skills are so important. And this is why you as teachers need to understand and coaches and whoever else on here. If you touch the lives of a child or another human, you need to understand change is hard. So that little guy may for two, three months never hit. And then he wakes up in the morning and his dog is dead. Or he wakes up in the morning and he's late and his mommy gets mad at him and he's stressed and he comes to school stressed. And when he's stressed, he can't access those skills. If you don't believe me about the 2,000 times, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to brush your teeth with the wrong hand. Let me know how that feels. Until, and probably want to put toothpaste on it because toothpaste in your nose and eyes doesn't feel good. But probably until you get about 2,000 times, your non-dominant hand will not be as efficient as your dominant hand. And what you're doing there is you're building a neural pathway. The same way you're asking that little boy to build a neural pathway when he says, stop. So we got to be forgiving and we got to be understanding that when we're stressed, we always fall back on our old ways. 
We have teachers who in conferences will tell us, this is phenomenal. I've made my action plan. I'm going to do it. And then we show up at their school and they are just like, and we're like, what? What is wrong? Where's your plan? And they're like, you know what you can do with your plan? Because when you're stressed, you always fall back to your old ways. What if your old ways are maladaptive? What if your old ways are illegal? We have teachers whose old ways could get them fired. And so we have to change them quickly. Another thing I do, we do a lot of family trainings. Oh my goodness, a lot of family trainings. And what we find is that poverty impacts EF skills. You become short-term focused instead of long focused. But what's great is this, there's a project called Mo uh, Mobility Mentoring. Phenomenal science coming out of that. What they found is that they actually increase the mother's EF skills and the child's without any intervention increases right along with it. And what they do there is they move low income moms into middle income positions by just attacking, strategizing how to build her EF skills. This is um, one of these pieces that as we're working with our teachers, most of them live in poverty. I was a Head Start teacher as a single mom. I remember it. I remember it, it was tough. And there were days that I was too busy trying to figure out how I was gonna feed my own children. And here comes my coach trying to tell me a new, shiny, bright new curriculum. And Joy, you gotta use this. And what do you think? And I'm just looking at her going, I don't think anything right now. And fortunately, I had an amazing mentor who used to sit down with me when the children were gone and we were calm and she would say, let's look at this in bite-sized pieces. And she would scaffold to help me reflect. Children need role models to see these EF skills in action. And if mom is super stressed, then who does that fall onto? You as teachers, you as coaches. And that is why understanding these skills, those courses that are offered are great. They're not nerdy like me. Let me just go ahead and say that. I'm not throwing this out there. I know I'm a nerd. I know I'm not really digestible. But these courses, we put our team through them, love them. They're like, Joy, this is so interesting. Not like you at all. I'm like, I know. They are interesting, they are digestible, they're practical and they're usable. But if you don't understand them, how in the world are you gonna build them? All right, let's go Haley. So a lot of times when I train, I use this analogy and I love my fish and my fish bowl analogy. Um, I am a teacher first and then I earned a mental health endorsement because I was failing more children than I was reaching. And now I'm working in neuroscience. Um, but this has remained true through all three of my adventures. <laughs> if you have a fish in a fishbowl and the water is dirty, what will happen to that healthy, healthy fish? He'll get sick. He might even die. Now, do I pull the fish out of the fishbowl and put medicine in his mouth and do mouth to gill resuscitation? No. If we're going to save the fish, we change the water. We change the water. We put him in clean water and maybe put some vitamins in the water. We change the water. And if we change the water, the fish gets better. Now, here's what's really cool about the fish. The fish does not know where the water stops or the water starts. The fish's life is the water. It goes through his gills. It goes through his mouth. He is literally one with the water. What if I told you in early childhood education, you are the water. The teacher is the water. The mother is the water. The grandmother is the water. The adult in the child's life is the social emotional climate. We are the water. And if we are running around wackadoodle, 
and we're wondering why our kids are wackadoodle, it's not really that hard to figure out. And here's the neuroscience behind why we're so important to little fishes. When a baby is born, their brain is 33% the size it will be when they're an adult. And when a baby is five, at the end of five, it's 95%. And so from birth to five, that brain, which is the only organ that is not developed at birth, let that sink in for a minute. Every other organ is ready to go. But the brain is the only organ not developed. They don't, baby, newborn babies come out like little paperweights. Thank goodness they're cute because they're, they're a lot of work, right? But why that is, is survival. In other words, I have to look at my adult in my world to see how they survive so I can survive. Are they highly anxious? Are they highly nervous? Are they reactive? Are they angry? Are they volatile? Are they calm? Are they responsive? Do they talk out their emotions? Do they know where their stuff is? Whatever skill the adult in my life has, I will have. Because I, as an infant, as a child, am looking to that adult organism and saying to my brain says, you need those skills to survive this world you live in. And it's an, it's, it's actually a pretty fascinating thing that humans do because think about it children in Australia need a different skill set than children in Alabama I just left New York from a neuroscience conference I don't have the skill set to live there FYI not my town do I not like it no it's fine for people in New York but I've never had to have the skill set to navigate New York I live in Alabama where our street signs are literally 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue. In New York, it's 6th Avenue, 6th and a half Avenue. I don't even know what Avenue. Where's 7th? It's gone. And so I don't have the brain power to navigate New York. But I'm going to tell you what, I've got friends with kids up there. Five-year-old could walk me through New York City and not think twice about it. Now, what do we have in Alabama that don't have in New York? Uh, we are outside all the time. We are hiking. We can, I mean, we got probably more nature stuff. When I was talking to people in New York, I was like, you know, we would talk and it's like, well, y'all like to go in the woods all that night? Heck yeah, we like to hike. We're outside folks. And New York is like, mm, we're going to go see a movie. <laughs> you got to have different skill sets for where you live. All right. So here's our challenge. And this is what we challenge ourselves with. And Amy and I are probably polar opposite people. I don't know if you could tell that from the way she does her slides and the way I do mine. Her slides are pictures, mine have words. She's more like, life is great. I'm more like, life is what it is, but okay. But this is something we do challenge ourselves with. And it's always great to have a partner who's the polar opposite from you because they're gonna make you step outside of your comfort zone. So this is what we ask. What if we acknowledge that stress, poverty, Pandemic hurts the development of EF skills in children and adults. We are slapping mental health diagnosis on kids left and right. There is so much money being poured in mental health diagnosis. Here's an example. I am blessed. I am state level, but I get to work in the field with challenging behaviors. Those are my people. I am a challenging behavior. I'm married to challenging behavior. I like challenging behavior children. Okay. It is what it is. And so my boss says, look, Joy, you can go out in the field two days a week and fix the children. <laughs> and I love it. It's what I do. But three days a week, you have to be writing reports. I don't like that. But I got called to work with a little guy. Fun kid. A very verbal. And they're like, Joy, he's been labeled ODD. Oh, at, at four? Yeah, at four. Well, I didn't think that was even a possibility in the DSM-5, but okay, let's, let's dance. Let's go. So as I'm working with him, I'm not seeing OD. Not at all. And so I say to the teacher, tell me about his life. And she's like, what? He said, tell me a story. She said, oh, okay. Mom and dad are divorced. 
dad has a wife and her baby was born two weeks ago. Mom is pregnant with a boyfriend um, and the baby's due in two weeks. And mom and boyfriend um, were on the outs. So he got displaced and was living with grandma for the last three months. Is that ODD? Or could that be a kid with anxiety? Could that be a kid who's around a lot of adults who are a little stressed out? And maybe we don't need to slap a huge tag that schools are very afraid of, ODD, at least around here they are, on every kid. Just because a kid says, no, probably not a tag. What's interesting is when we put simple executive function games in place, guess what happened? Suddenly he became the cutest little ball, red-headed, blue-eyed little monster ever. We just love him. But had we gone the other way, medication, ODD, IEP, It looks like we've lost Joy for a second here. We'll see if she comes back. I know she had some spotty Wi-Fi. All right, looks like she, we're going. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Joy should hopefully be back in a minute or two. Um, but we can kind of move on and Amy and I will try to answer them to the best of our abilities as well. Can you, can you see me? Yeah, you're back. Oh, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I went ahead and paid my phone bill real quick. I'm so sorry. Okay. Can you go back to the other slide? Thank you. Also, what if when we see our teacher, let's just pick back up. That's called cognitive flexibility and that's EF skills. See that y'all? This is, I did that on purpose. So you guys... No, you don't let things rub you wrong. You just keep on trucking. That's EF skills. All right. What if we look at our teachers as stressed? And what if we coach them thinking, okay, maybe she's not resistant. Do you know how many times we've got called in to, oh, Joy, we have a, oh, we have a resistant coach. Resistant, resistant. And it's like red flags go up. <laughs> and then I get in the room and, She's not. She's doing the best she can with the tools she has. And if she's stressed, those tools are limited. So let's give her what she needs. She's not resistant. Nobody wants to fail. Also, what if, what if EF skills are what's been missing in our K-12 academics and our ECE programs? What if? What if we've not been building 21st century skills in our schools that have 21st century banners all over the flipping buildings? What if? At what point do we start using science to guide education the same way science guides medicine? What? Every teacher is a brain builder a neuroplastician, if you will. If you remember one thing from this training today, I have changed your brain from when you started watching the Zoom call. I have restructured your brain. That's powerful. Imagine if our teachers understood their role as to be that powerful. Imagine if our coaches understood that role. And that is what these what if challenges are. And that's what's gonna change our state because we need to change. All right, now Haley, we'll do questions. If anybody has any, I don't know. If you do though, I'd, 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 I'll try to answer them or I'll make something up that sounds really good. I'm just kidding, <laughs> I will not do that, sorry. <laughs> To answer the one question that just popped in the chat of how to access this webinar, again, it is being recorded. 
Um, and NHSA was going to share it. And I know that uh, we, oh, they'll send a recording to all of you guys. And then Reflection Sciences will also put it up on our YouTube channel so you can access it anytime again there as well. No questions? 